we are going to start this WEF session war in Europe year two. In the Davos opening address, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said Europe's reaction to the war is the latest example of how our union has pulled together when it matters the most. And it's almost one year since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine and the war is absolutely having huge impact not only on Ukraine but also across Europe and across the whole world. What are the policy pathways to tackle and the points of vulnerability to address in Europe as Russia's unprovoked war rages on? And this is what we're going to discuss now at this session. It is a great honor for me to introduce you the speakers of the session. Uh, we have Sanna Marin, Prime Minister of Finland. Gregory Meeks, Congressman for New York, ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Maya Sandu, President of the Republic of Moldova. And Jean-Pierre Clamadieu, Chairman of the Board NG Group. My name is Sasha Vakulina. I'm with Euronews and I'm going to be moderating this session. The first question is going to be to Sanna Marin. To what extent has the war resulted in broad shifts when it comes to all these aspects, economic, political, and also mi military links and connections across Europe. And in what ways can we expect these links and connections to continue to evolve this year as we're going into year two of the war in Europe? Well, thank you for having us in, in this panel. I, I fully agree with the Commission's President Ursula von der Leyen uh, that the war is not only affecting Ukraine, it affects the whole Europe, the whole world actually. We are seeing uh, this geopolitical change in the world uh, and there is a war of values going on in the world. The rules-based order is being challenged and this affects everyone, not only Ukraine but everyone uh, in in the world and the war affects Europe in very concrete ways as well we are also not only in the war in Ukraine but also in energy war uh, in in Europe Russia is using energy uh, as a tool as a weapon against Europe and it it tries uh, to diminish our support to Ukraine Putin tries uh, us to be afraid uh, of Russia, what might happen. Uh, he, he wants us and our citizens to think what are the prices uh, of the war. And we are already seeing uh, people frustrated with the high energy prices everywhere in Europe. But the answer is not uh, to weaken our support towards Ukraine. The answer needs to be actually the opposite. We need to send more support to Ukraine more weapons, more humanitarian aid, more financial aid, to make sure that the war will, will end as soon as possible and for Ukrainian win. And this is crucial. So our aspect uh, of Putin's uh, screwdrive that he is using now uh, with the energy against Europe should be that we are sending more support for Ukraine. President Sander, alongside socioeconomic disruptions, what are the other key points of vulnerabil vulnerabilities uh, with the effects of the war exposed in Europe and what is being done to mitigate those vulnerabilities because your country has a very specific position when it comes to this war in Europe and Russia's aggression on Ukraine. Of course, Moldova was more vulnerable because it uh, depended 100% on the gas purchases before the war started. Now we get only 40% of our gas needs uh, in, uh, from Gazprom and we managed quickly to diversify into, to find our uh, other sources uh, to supply uh, energy to the country. Uh, the propaganda, which is a very big issue, disinformation, and this is, of course, a big issue for my country, but I think this is a big issue for many countries, and we need to learn how to be more efficient um, to tackle this issue, is the cyber security. I agree to, totally agree with the issue that Russia counted on this blackmailing us uh, with the energy crisis, and Europe managed to find a solution, and this was not easy. And yes, we have to pay, to pay a price, and, and we feel bad that our people have to pay a high price. But we believe in democracy, we value uh, democracy, we want to be part of the free world, and the only solution is to stay together. And yes, it is difficult, but we have to help Ukraine uh, win this war, because otherwise all of us will be in danger. Monsieur Clamadier, which underlying factors of the current economic downturn and potential recession facing Europe you think are most exacerbated by the war? And to what degree will Europe's economic recovery hinge on the outcomes of this war? We are in a situation today where 
I'm pretty confident to say that there won't be disruption in, uh, in the supply of energy, neither gas nor electricity uh, in Europe during the last uh, few months of, uh, of winter. Prices are starting to go down. We are not back where we were uh, uh, two years ago, but we are back at a level which is a bit more uh, sustainable. And I don't want to downplay the impact of this, uh, of this conflict. Uh, obviously, this creates a big competitiveness issues for industries in Europe versus, uh, versus the US. I think it will probably take another couple of years before the flow of uh, natural, of uh, GNL, uh, LNG, sorry, is uh, again offering uh, visibility for uh, European consumers. But frankly speaking, thanks to the alignment of political decision makers and industries, we've been able to go through uh, this, uh, this year of 2022, probably much better than we expected when this conflict started. Obviously, the 24th of February in just about a month is going to mark one year. Everybody wants it's a $1 billion or even more question about how, for how long we're in this and how it's going to, how it's going to go. What, what do you think on that? The key elements are that we have to say very uh, frankly uh, and out loud that we will support Ukraine as long as needed. There isn't that kind of scenario or possibility that, that the support from Europe or the Western world or democracies will diminish. That's not a possibility. We will support as long as needed. Five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever it takes, we will support Ukraine. And this will not stop. And it's for Ukrainians to decide when they are ready to negotiate, when they are ready uh, to make uh, some peace agreement that they will could agree on and we will support our job is to support them and another uh, way that we could uh, influence uh, the the situation uh, we are already uh, sending arms we are sending weapons and we need to send more and more advanced weapons we need to continue sending financial support and uh, humanitarian support uh, taking uh, refugees from Ukraine putting heavier sanctions against Russia but one thing that I really think that might uh, affect the situation is the frozen assets. There are a lot of frozen assets from the Russian Central Bank, a lot of frozen assets from uh, oligarchs, uh, and we need to find solutions. How to use these assets? I know it's legally uh, and, and from a legal point of view, it's a very difficult matter and very difficult issue, but I think we need to find solutions. How to use these funds to support Ukraine? To rebuild Ukraine, I think this could affect uh, the war more than we think, because there are many interests behind these assets and these, uh, this money. So, so I think that might really affect the situation. It doesn't solve everything, but I think that's the one thing that we haven't yet used. And I think we need to find the legal framework uh, to do this, to use those assets to support Ukraine. And this process of rebuilding and reconstruction, it's not being postponed. It's not like mm. wh when the war is over, that's going to happen now. We, you have all known, and you visited the country, you know exactly that it has already started step by step. It's from the regions, it's from the suburbs, uh, the places that have been liberated. Mm. They're already being reconstructed. So this is, of course, uh, something that is already on and is going to be in focus mm. this year as well. Yeah. Um, Gregory Mix, what's your assessment of the possible trajectories of what the war in Ukraine might take going into 2023? And what possible trajectories could NATO take as well? I think that you will continue to see Ukraine winning this war and fighting when we give them the ammunition and what they need to fight. Because that determination, that's not going to change. That's unshakable. And what is as the Prime Minister just indicated, that is absolutely devastating to Putin is our solid unity. He's hoping and looking for ways to shake it. So we've got to make sure that, and I think that the Russia propaganda is going to be defeated moving forward. Some individuals, you know, when I moved around before and I talked to some people, even some in the United States, uh, at one point, listening to the propaganda, thinking that, you know, as Russia was talking about, that it was Ukraine that was being the aggressors. Obviously not true. So I see that us coming closer together and bringing in other allies from other areas of the world also. Because as this intensifies and they see the humanitarian crises 
that is taking place. When they see that people are forced, that, that, that are being utilized, civilians are being utilized, killed, freezing to death in, 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 in cold weather, when they see the human dangers that have been taking place and how it is a humanitarian criminal act that Putin is committing, that will bring us even closer together. So as I look at where we're going down, we're not going to get weak. I know, you know people have talked about uh, certain things because of the Congress has changed in the United States of America, that now in the House, for example, it's, uh, it's a split. Overwhelmingly, the American people, overwhelmingly the people, for example, Democrats and Republicans, are focused and standing strongly behind Ukraine. And that's only going to intensify as we move forward, which makes me believe that that will lead to success in the long run as we get through the winter and into the summertime. The other aspect I want to go now is that the war in Ukraine, as a consequence, had a we all have a greater appreciation of alliances as well and working together, and of course NATO being one of them. So I'm going to ask you about that. Uh, you know, when Finland and Sweden obviously announced NATO aspiration, there was this... Uh, there was this tweet that said, I can't remember the author, and I apologize if you were the author, that what Putin tried to do, he wanted to Finlandization of Ukraine, but instead what he did was Ukrainization of Finland and Sweden. So you are now on the way there. So what, to, to what extent, uh, how is the process going? Because this was uh, Sweden and Finland NATO aspiration happened in response to the war in Ukraine. And how is it going? How is the cooperation happening in the solidarity as well? Because you are doing it, not just yourself, but you said that you're going to be doing it only hand in hand with Sweden. Because mm. that's another alliance, that's another appreciation of alliances. Mm. Well, the Finnish atmosphere uh, and the mindset of people changed at the same time when Russia attacked Ukraine. In that mo before that moment, uh, if you ask Finnish people, do they think that Finland should join NATO, the uh, majority would have said, no, we have that possibility to apply. That's very important that we have that possibility. But we didn't have that kind of discussion, active discussion before. And if you ask the, the majority of, of Finnish people or the parliament, they would have said, no, we don't see that, that we should right now apply to NATO membership. But when Russia attacked Ukraine, everything changed. The world changed. Our neighbor was no longer the same neighbor. Uh, it was... Uh, aggressive, uh, aggressive neighbor that went uh, across that border and, and Finnish people ask themselves what is the border that Russia wouldn't cross? And that's the NATO border. And that's why Finnish people uh, wanted uh, us to go to NATO. Uh, 188 uh, parliamentarians out of 200 voted in favor of NATO uh, membership. So we, we are not we don't have 100%, but we are very close uh, in, in our parliament as well. Uh, and we have this, this unity in Finland. We have this uh, cohesion and consensus about the NATO application. And I'm also very happy that we made this decision at the same time that, that our Swedish neighbors uh, did, because we are also sharing, of course, the same geopolitical uh, atmosphere, the same geopolitical security environment. So I think from NATO's perspective also, it's very important that Finland and Sweden is applying and, and entering NATO together. Of course, there are still two countries that hasn't ratified, Hungary and Turkey. And I have talked, uh, for example, with, with uh, Prime Minister Orban uh, every time that we meet uh, in, in European Council. And, and he has uh, said that they will ratify as soon as the parliament will start uh, its uh, term this spring, hopefully very soon. Uh, Turkey, we don't have that timetable yet. Of course, we hope that that will happen sooner uh, than later. We are fulfilling uh, all the criteria, we are ticking all the boxes uh, that is needed to become a NATO member. And actually, for example, Finland is already using over 2% of our GDP to defense. And we have done this for quite some time. And we are seeing a lot of uh, support from Ukrainian people to fight for their country. They are fighting for their freedom, for their independence and their country. And if you ask Finnish people how willing they are to, to defend Finland, I think we are ranked number one. Ukraine is 
number two. So, so we have been in war with Russia and, and we know what that's like. And we don't want ever again, ever again, there to be a war in Finnish soil. And that's why we are applying to NATO. So that there wouldn't be a war in Finland ever again. That's the border that Russia wouldn't cross. And that's why we are applying to NATO. President Sandu, uh, Moldova is applying for the European Union. That's another, of course, as well, alliance and this appreciation of it. How important is that? How, and how also the view on it changed? Because Moldova has also experienced some of the opinion polls that were not necessarily always uh, supporting the idea. And also, uh, just to follow up on um, what Gregory Meek said there, the propaganda issue, of course, is something that happened a lot in Moldova over years. I actually believe that Moldova's chance to survive as a democracy is only within the EU and just being realistic about what's going to happen in our region in the next, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Of course, we uh, all hope for a uh, victory, for a speedy victory of Ukraine, and this is going to happen, but uh, we cannot uh, see Russia becoming a democratic country uh, very soon, and this means that the uh, challenges for the region are still going to be there. Uh, Moldova survived, I mean, managed to deal with the challenges uh, that you asked me at the beginning uh, in, in, uh, and to a big extent thanks to the support we received from the EU and from the uh, development partners, and we're very grateful. And it is important to have a stable Moldova. It's important for us. It's important for Ukraine. It's important for the EU. For the EU, it is important to have a peaceful and stable Ukraine. It is important to have a peaceful and stable Moldova. And that's why the EU enlargement is important. I think Ukraine has proved it's paying the highest price uh, for the democracy and for uh, the EU values. Uh, Moldovans have been doing their best. And yes, the propaganda is uh, still strong and we are fighting with the propaganda, but we have more than 70% of people uh, over the years, despite the propaganda, uh, despite the poverty and the many problems we've been facing, we have this uh, constant support for the EU integration. And I think the recent um, gesture by the, uh, the generosity showed by the Moldovan people when they managed to help uh, six, seven hundred thousand of, uh, of Ukrainian uh, refugees shows that we, uh, we value the, the EU values and uh, we value peace and we value freedom. Um, so the EU enlargement will make the EU stronger uh, because the EU needs a peaceful and stable Ukraine, Moldova, and the rest of the countries which are aspiring for the, for the EU accession. President Santo, do you think, uh, as a long shot for the bit longer future, do you think that NATO aspirations is something that Moldova could go into after? We do feel how vulnerable we are. Ukraine is defending us, literally. Um, and we are uh, taking steps to improve our um, defense sector, but we are very realistic about what we can do. Uh, we are a democratic country, and we have to have the discussion. There, there should be uh, popular support. But we are having this serious discussion now on, on whether we can, by ourselves, uh, defend us in a new world where we see that war is a real danger. Jean-Pierre Clamadieu, how have the impacts of the war in Ukraine reshaped the global energy landscape and what are your expectations when it comes to speeding up this transition away from fossil fuel dependency as well on Russian but also the transition in general? I think the, uh, the challenge for Europe is really to make sure that we can strengthen our energy system and this is completely aligned with the, uh, the need for, uh, to speed up the energy transition. We don't have any uh, uh, fossil, fossil resources in Europe, a bit of coal, but it's not something we want to, to build on. So the challenge now is to make sure that we can speed up the development of renewables. The EU has an agenda, the Fit for 55 agenda. We need to make sure that the current situation, the mitigation of the crisis does not slow down this agenda. On the contrary, and what we see today is a number of uh, decisions which indeed should create the conditions for us to speed up development of renewable, to speed up development of storage, speed up the development of hydrogen. With this objective of speeding up energy transition, this will help us achieve strategic independence. And this is something that we absolutely need. 
Thank you so much for this session. I wish we had more time. Hopefully next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.